Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. Time is running out for negotiators trying to break the impasse between the United States and Iran and revive the deal curbing Tehran's nuclear ambitions. Iran is still enriching uranium. The Biden administration is talking of giving up on the current diplomatic track. My guest is an advisor to Iran's negotiators in Vienna, Mohammed Morandi. If a nuclear deal can't be done, how real is the danger of a catastrophic war in the Middle East? Mohamed Morandi in Vienna. Welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Now, you are in the Austrian capital with the Iranian negotiating team. US negotiators are there too. But it does look as though efforts to revive the international deal on your country's nuclear program are running out of road. Why is that? The Americans are dragging their feet, and so are the Europeans. They left the deal. From the very beginning, they violated the deal. Then they left and tore up the deal. They imposed maximum pressure sanctions on citizens in Iran, killing people intentionally, which, and that's basically waging war by other means. And now, now the Iranians want the sanctions removed. And in order for the deal to work, the other side has to accept removing sanctions. They can't have their cake and eat it too. So what we're seeing is that the Americans and the Europeans are resisting. They want to keep sanctions in place. They don't want a proper verification mechanism. And they don't want to give proper guarantees to the Iranians. And that's simply not acceptable. Let's talk about these sanctions. Your contention, you've just given it to me, is that, quote unquote, the sanctions are killing people. And yet elsewhere, I've seen you quoted as saying, you know what, we don't really care about these sanctions because even if the Americans continue to impose them, we will survive, life will continue in Iran. So which is it? Are they desperately affecting your country or not? No, that is actually a misrepresentation, a, an intentional misrepresentation of what I said by pro-Western Iranian media. And I should point out that we have a very large pro-Western media in Iran, even though they're the minority in Iran, but they have a loud voice. Unlike in Western countries, where people like myself have been removed from Facebook, removed from Instagram, Iranian TV is sanctioned, so Western audiences cannot hear Iranian voices, Western voices can be heard loud and clear in Tehran. What I said was that the United States has imposed maximum pressure sanctions and threatening Iran when they impose already all that they can impose. Trump, if he could have hurt ordinary Iranians more than he did, he would have done so. So with the, basically what I'm saying is that they are hurting Iran as much as possible. So they should stop threatening Iran. They know they cannot do more. So they should be serious, sit at the negotiating table and accept the nuclear deal as it was written, the JCPOA in 2015, if they want Iran to go back to 2015, they have to come back with Iran too. They can't keep sanctions that were imposed after 2015, and they cannot have a, they cannot have a verification process for Iran, yet have no verification process for their actions. They say that you must accept the rules as they were in 2015. They say that right now Iran is demand demanding guarantees that if a new deal or a revived deal is agreed upon, that it has to be forever. And that, of course, is not realistic under the American political system because no president can guarantee that a, a future administration would stick, stick to the deal. That's precisely why Trump reversed course after Obama had signed the deal. You, you can't expect the Americans to deliver you something that is simply impossible. Stephen, when the sanctions 
were imposed under Obama. And they were also maximum pressure sanctions targeting women and children. It was a means of war. Ultimately, when the United States was forced to accept Iran's right to enrich uranium, the Iranians came to the negotiating table with the Americans and the P5 plus one. An agreement was signed, good or bad. In that agreement, Iran agreed to do a number of things, and they did them. The International Atomic Energy Agency verified every act of Iran and verified that Iran was in complete compliance of its obligations. Whereas the United States, from day one, from day one under Obama, began violating the deal. On paper, the United States was supposed to allow Iran, Iran the Iranian banking sector, to reconnect to the international banking system. But what we saw in reality was that Obama told his treasury to threaten banks, to threaten financial institutions, to threaten um, shipping companies and insurance companies not to work with Iran. That was a clear violation of the deal. So it wasn't Iran that was violating the deal. They are in no position to complain about Iran's actions. And then when Trump came, he simply tore up the deal. And the Europeans... Yeah, but please, please, if you would, just address my specific point. Are you prepared to accept that if a deal is signed, if you and the Americans can find common ground, you will have to live with the fact that it, it can't be defined as a forever treaty. It is going to be a deal which exists as long as the will is there in the American political system to keep to the deal. You, you can't have a guarantee the American system will not deliver. But Stephen, that's not even the only problem. The Americans want to keep many of the sanctions right now. They don't want to give up the sanctions. Guarantees aside, that's something they can negotiate. How about verification? The Iranians are saying, the Americans and the Europeans will say on paper, we've removed the sanctions. But when the banking sector, when the insurance companies, when the shipping companies don't work with Iran because behind closed doors they're telling, telling them something else, then what does Iran do? So, see, so I, Iran I, is I, not... Yeah, okay, you've made, you made the point. You, but in essence, what you're saying is you do not have one shred of faith or trust in what the Americans are bringing to the table. And I think it's also true to point out that you, on the Iranian side, refuse to talk face to face with the Americans anyway. It all has to be done through third parties. So if that's the case, I'm just wondering why you're bothering wasting your time and everybody else's by going through this charade in Vienna. Without a shred of trust or good faith, it's a waste of time. Well, first of all, the Iranians negotiated extensively with the United States. And then we had the JCPOA, the nuclear deal. And what happened? The Americans violated the deal under Obama, under Trump, they tore up the deal. Under Biden, they continued to implement Trump's policies. So if the Americans want to talk to the Iranians, first the Americans have to go and implement what they agreed to do when they negotiated with the Iranians previously. The Iranian leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, said around the time when the nuclear deal was being negotiated, that if the Americans implement the nuclear deal in good faith and the Europeans by extension, then we can think about discussing other issues. But the Americans and the Europeans never did that at all. But, Under but, Obama, forget right. Trump. But trust, trust cuts both ways, Professor Morandi. There is a trust problem in the United States precisely because they see what Iran has been doing since 2018 in terms of ramping up the uranium enrichment program. And you've gone far beyond even your previous capability of enriching to 20%. You've now got systems in place which allow you substantial enrichment capacity all the way up to 60%. Why on earth are you doing that? Why shouldn't Iran do that? Iran has every right to do so within the framework of international law. I'll tell you within why. Framework... I'll tell you why. If you ask me no, the question, me, I'll tell you explain. why. Because it's quite simple. Because you say your nuclear program is completely civilian oriented. It's all about developing your power infrastructure. You simply don't need to enrich uranium to that level to have the power capacity you want. It's quite clear. And I think you know this as well as I that Iran has expanded its peaceful nuclear program because the only way to force the Americans and the Europeans to abide by their commitments is for the Iranians to gain leverage. You know this as well as I. The Americans and the Europeans are brutal. The sanctions that they impose on ordinary women and children are crimes against humanity. These are people that have no sense of morality. 
just like what we saw in, in what they do to Venezuela and your government steals Venezuelan gold or the destruction of Libya or Yemen. Iran looks around and sees what's going on, the destruction of Syria through a dirty war. The Iranians need to protect themselves. So the Iranians, therefore, uh -huh. they will not. So the Iranians, therefore, they have to use leverage to force the Americans well, and the look, Europeans well, you, to come you, back. You call it leverage. Many people watching and listening to this might call it a threat. What you seem to be saying is we're going to enrich uranium, develop our capacity to 60 percent, and who knows, maybe beyond it to the 95 percent you need to develop a nuclear weapon simply as a threat to hang over the United States and its allies to tell them that if they don't do what we want in Tehran, we will pursue a nuclear weapon. Is that what you mean by leverage? Stephen, you know as well as I that if Iran wanted to pursue a nuclear weapon, Iran would have had it many years ago. The only countries that have gone beyond threatening are Western countries. They've tried to crush Iranian society by through sanctions, just like what they're doing in Afghanistan, just like what they're doing in a host of other countries. They're trying to crush women and children through sanctions. So this is not these are not threats. These are actions by Western regimes that try to gain leverage through the suffering of ordinary people. The Iranians are quite willing to go back to the nuclear deal. But the other side has to come back with Iran as well. Iran won't appease right. the Europeans. But this is where it gets complicated, because you've been very candid with me about what Iran is up to right now and the degree to which you are seeking leverage. And the fact is that between 2018 and now, you have acquired a whole host of new capacity in your uranium enrichment facilities. As I understand it from the latest IAEA report, you now have a stockpile of uranium enriched to 60 percent. That's at least 17 kilograms might be significantly more. You now have 400 installed so-called IR6 centrifuges, which are all about this maximum enrichment capacity. So things have changed since 2018. If you are going back to seek a deal with the United States, are you saying to the Americans, we will hand over all of this 60 percent enriched uranium? We won't keep it. We'll give it up. We'll also give up the capacity, the scientific knowledge and also the equipment that we've acquired in the last three years. Is that what you're saying? Look, Stephen, you're speaking from a very Eurocentric position. I, I find it very disturbing when I speak here and the, the, the only thing that cannot go back is for us to go back and have the women and children who died as a result of the sanctions be revived. We can't bring them back to life. And they're much more important than anything that the Europeans and the Americans want from Iran. And it's absolutely disgusting that Western countries would do this to ordinary Iranians. But Professor the Iranians Romney, I, I, have, I, you, wait, you, you just make one that moment, point. A, you just make one. the point with passion and with power, but you're not addressing my question. If the, there is the, to be a deal, there has to be some compromise. And of course, I'll be quizzing U.S. officials about the compromises they're prepared to make. But I'm quizzing you about the compromises Iran is prepared to make. And my question directly to you is, what See. are you going to do with the, all of this 60 percent enriched uranium if you're to do a deal with the international community and in particular the Americans? Stephen, that's for the negotiators to talk about. But the Iranians are willing to go back to 2015. It's the other side that is not willing to go back to the 2015 deal. The Iranians are willing to do everything that it was supposed to do when the JCPOA was signed. And it did that, and it did so back then. It would be also good to remind your viewers that when the United States violated the deal under Obama, the Iranians continued to abide by their commitments. When the United States and the Europeans violated all of their commitments under Trump and the United States tore up the deal, the Iranians continue to abide by all of their commitments for a full year. Iran was the only side abiding by its commitments. And then only after that, in five stages, which took a year itself, a second year, did the Iranians gradually decrease their commitments to put pressure on the Europeans to do something about these violations. Do you, yeah, I think we, we, we've gone through the detail and I'm not sensing much movement. And it, it's fair to say that there isn't 
much apparent movement in the US position or in the Iranian position. Do you accept that 2022 could be an extremely dangerous year in the Middle East because the Americans are convinced you are now, in the words of Antony Blinken, the Secretary of State, a very, very short time away from Iran getting enough fissile material for a nuclear weapon. And we know the Israelis are watching this very closely and their Prime Minister Naftali Bennett has reserved the right quite explicitly to not be bound by anything that comes out of the talks in Vienna. He says, we are not and will not be a party to any agreement. So there could be this long dreaded conflict in 2022 over your nuclear program, couldn't there? Well, we know about Western conflicts and how they destroy country after country. But Iran is not Iraq. Iran is not even Vietnam. Iran and its allies in this region are far more powerful than anything the Americans have confronted before. The Israeli regime is too puny and small to do anything significant to Iran. And if it attacks Iran, the retaliation will be something disproportionate and crushing. So I don't think the Israelis would be that foolish. But the Americans know quite well that if they attack Iran, all those bases in, these, in the region and all those countries that are hosting those bases will pay a heavy price and it will bring about the destruction of the global economy. So there is a balance of terror here. And the Iranians don't believe that the United States will be foolish enough to engage in war. See, so the smart thing is for the Americans to negotiate. The smart thing is for the Iranians have already compromised. The JCPOA was the compromise. And as we speak, the Iranians are willing to go more than willing to go back to the compromise because the Iranians want the sanctions that are targeting women and children to end. But the Europeans and the Americans are behaving just like Trump did. The Biden regime and European regimes are behaving exactly like Trump, even though I they pretend so, to be otherwise. The problem with all the rhetoric you're giving me is that you're making it harder and harder for Joe Biden to actually develop a different strategy toward Iran. When you talk of bringing down a, a reign of violence on US targets across the Middle East, and of course we know your relationship with Hezbollah, with militias in Iraq, and of course with the Houthis in Yemen, you're going to make it impossible for Biden to do a deal with Iran. Stephen, you are the one who is talking about war and violence, and the Israeli is not waiting for anyone. The Iranians are not going to initiate any conflict. The Iranians have been, the, your government supported Saddam Hussein. Your government gave Saddam Hussein chemical weapons to use, your governments, Western governments, to use against our country. I survived two chemical attacks. Many of my friends didn't. Iran never retaliated with chemical weapons. That's the difference between us and your governments. Our government does not initiate conflict. So, so to be clear, your... all right, to be, to be clear, because again, I just want to try to be specific and, and as brief as, as I can be. You're saying that right now, Tehran sees no difference between the Biden administration and its strategy toward your country and that of Donald Trump. Let's look at the evidence. The Biden administration is using maximum pressure sanctions, the same sanctions that Trump was using. Why is he doing that? to get concessions from Iran. That's exactly what Trump wanted. Trump imposed this, this array of sanctions under different labels called the maximum pressure campaign in order to force Iran to change the JCPOA. I think that is exactly what Biden is doing. Right. Otherwise, the deal is very clear for all sides. But it, the Europeans yeah, but know. It, all right. But it, it, it's not all about the nuclear deal anyway, is it, when it comes to sanctions? You, you might wish it to pin it all on that deal, but actually some of the U.S. sanctions, very significant sanctions, are connected to Iran's human rights abuses and other abuses, not actually specifically to the nuclear program. When the world looks at what Iran is doing in terms of its political prisoners and in particular its treatment of foreign nationals inside your country, it doesn't see a Tehran government which appears to want to improve its human rights record. Please, let's not talk about human rights. Otherwise, we'll have to talk about Assange and solitary confinement 
and many other people. Let's not talk about human rights when your government, the Western and Western governments in the United States are imposing maximum pressure on ordinary women and children, killing people. Let's not talk about human rights when Afghanistan, Iraq, Lebanon, Syria, Yemen, Libya, Venezuela, Cuba are all suffering under Western sanctions. There's nothing that the West can talk about when it comes to human rights. They are, they are the enemy of human rights when it comes to our region and other parts of the world. What is important, what is important though, is that all of these sanctions that were imposed under the Trump regime, whatever the labels, they were explicitly, they were explicit, the Trump regime, about using these sanctions under different labels to force Iran to renegotiate the JCPOA. That is appeasement. And the Iranians will not have that. No, I, so the intention of all these sanctions was to get concessions from Iran. Iran won't accept that. If the Europeans and the Americans want, or if they're serious about the deal, they cannot continue to hold the throats of ordinary Iranians and expect Iran to go back to 2015. We both go to 2015, or no one goes to 2015. I take it from that answer then. You're not even interested in discussing uh, the plight of Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, the British citizen who is still facing uh, detention in Iran. She's been in detention since 2016 under the notion that she was plotting to topple the Iranian government, a charge which she and her family say is utterly ridiculous. You've also, I noticed, put back in detention a French national, Fariba Adelkak, uh, again under uh, charges which the French government describe as ridiculous. It looks to the outside world as though you're doing this simply because you're not getting what you want from the international community. Is that it? Well, Western countries are not the international community. That era has finished. Western countries are a handful of countries and their clout is decreasing. You should go and ask your prime minister, who at the time when he was the foreign secretary went to parliament and said that she violated Iranian laws. So. He said that. No, he, he didn't you, actually yes, say he did. that. No, they, he, he, he didn't yes, say he did. she had violated any Iranian law. You know, Basically he didn't, what he said he didn't, meant he, he didn't was say that. She that. Was violating, she but was but not I do allowed. find what you've she just was, said interesting in the sense you're saying, you know what? Don't, illegally. Yeah, well, let, let's, look, not, Stephen, let's not misquote, Stephen, let's not misquote Stephen, anybody. But let us also Stephen, stick to the point you, you, you just made about Iran not really caring very much about the Western powers anymore. Is that because you've made a strategic decision to put all of your faith in, for example, a 25-year-long economic agreement you've just signed with China. You're looking eastward and you think, do you, that you can survive without the dollar economy, without the US lifting its sanctions? I just wonder whether this faith you have, you can outlast the American pressure on your country, whether it's justified. Well, I think what is not justified is the Americans trying to strangle ordinary people. That's what's not justified. That's sickening and ugly. And the Iranians will look everywhere for cooperation. The Americans, if they don't, if the Europeans and the Americans don't want to abide by their commitments in the JCPOA, should the Iranians just sit there? The Iranians will improve their relationship with the global south. They'll improve their relationship with neighboring countries. And they'll improve their relationship with those countries that don't want ordinary Iranians to suffer. So if you don't want Iran to have greater relations with the Chinese, if you don't want Iran to improve their relations with the Russians, then start behaving normally. Start behaving like normal countries instead right. of being exceptional and calling your countries the international community and expecting Iran to abide by its commitments, whereas your countries do not have to abide right. by theirs. The greatest wow. human rights violation, Stephen, is making ordinary people suffer. And that is what Western governments do. Mohammed Morandi, sadly, we're out of time, but I thank you very much indeed for joining me from Vienna. Thank you for having me.